Ryan Stanton here with ASAP Frontline in Chattanooga, Tennessee, talking today with Dr. Uh, Michael Girardi. So uh, neither of us in our home states here, but uh, coming together and saw a topic that he was going to speak on at the uh, Tennessee ASAP Scientific Assembly and uh, felt like it was something that we needed to talk about because it is one of our greatest fears in the practice of medicine in general, but especially emergency medicine, is that over overwhelming feeling that you're being watched very closely by people with JD degrees uh, that they're just watching over your shoulder waiting to pounce on your um, on your mistakes and misgivings and things like that and so uh, topic here was uh, some of the top t- tips to uh, keep from getting sued in emergency medicine so uh, I felt like that was something that uh, people would be very interested in in trying to uh, avoid their day in court. So, uh, Dr. Girardi, uh, thank you for joining me. Ryan, it's good to see you again. It's always a good time to come to these Southern Conferences, Tennessee and the SEC Conference down in Destin. Yeah, I've seen uh, uh, Dr. Girardi and I, have, we've been um, regulars for the grilled oysters down in Destin for the SEC, uh, which is now adds the Big Ten or Big 12, whatever number they're with, uh, conference uh, uh, talks uh, in conference down there in Destin. So um, good to be down here um, in the South, and I'm sure um, still being now in the late stages of winter when we record this, that you're uh, happy to be a little bit out of the weather that's been dealing with the Northeast recently. You're absolutely correct. <laughs> and it's only 52 degrees, but still that's probably almost 50 degrees warmer than you're dealing with. So give us an idea about, um, just kind of roll us into the introduction um, of the uh, nidus of this talk and and kind of where um, where your angle is when it comes to avoiding lawsuits in emergency medicine. As an officer of the college recently, I can tell you that our members are very concerned about medical liability. It's one of their primary concerns, and so we're constantly looking for ways to mitigate that risk. But let me say this. You can't go through practice with paranoia about being sued. One of the biggest factors that create satisfaction for patients is to know that you cared about them and not being in a defensive mode and actually enjoying being at the bedside and talking with patients gives an air of concern that's really exists for us as emergency physicians. I think that's one of the priorities you should have to avoid a lawsuit. Unfortunately, the facts suggest with the recent study of Annals of Internal Medicine in February 2018 that 75% of emergency physicians will be sued sometime in their career, but if you practice to be age 65, 95% chance that you'll be named in a lawsuit. Fortunately, though, 75% of those are usually determined in favor of the defense, but only in awards are paid out in less than 20%. So the numbers are in our favor, but you know, from the folks I've talked to in lawsuits, um, it's not necessarily the monetary aspect that is the biggest price that you pay. I think one of the biggest prices we pay is one is the time, the stress, um, how it changes your practice and your approach to practice. And people I've seen that have been sued completely changes their approach. They uh, many times will then uh, order more, over order, over admit, uh, over paranoia. And um, I, th- I think one of the greatest things that we have in medicine is confidence um, that when we go in, that we're going to be able to get the information we need. And I think that takes a huge hit when you get um, when you get sued, even when we have something that you know personally, when I have something that I feel like I should have picked up on. You know, it really, I feel like, impacts my ability to walk into that room with the confidence necessary to get that information. So what is what is that toll we're going to see um, with a lawsuit other, other than even without a, a judgment against us? Well, I'd like to address that last factor first. The, the studies have shown that if you've been named in a lawsuit, you are at much greater risk to be named again because of that defensive error, the, the paranoia again, the the discomfort of dealing with it, the, the antagonistic system that our legal system is for these types of solving these disputes. Now, you alluded to the fact that the time factor. Yes, the time continuum from the time you're named in a suit, the time it's resolved could be three to five years. In New York, New Jersey, it's five to six years. And so that's a long time for that weight to be carried on the shoulders of an emergency physician. But what I tell my docs and advanced providers to do once they've been named is try to compartmentalize it try to put it away in a dark box and realize that most of these are resolved in your favor. You're a good physician. You shouldn't be down on yourself. Because the other big concern I have is suicide rate goes up, actually, for people who have been named in a lawsuit. So we've got to, from a resilience and wellness factor, we've got to really embrace our colleagues who have been named in a suit and try to really reassure them that this is a a, a matter of fact part of our business, and we've got to learn how to deal with it so we can function the way we were trained. So uh, 
time. It is a nuisance and it's extremely intrusive in your life, but I recommend that if you are named that you really have a confidant like your spouse, significant other, but also your attorney in your defense. And sometimes groups allow a physician to be a physician mentor or ombudsman for you to help support you through the process. I think all of us have heard at some point, you know, one of the major things and challenges we have in emergency medicine is we're starting fresh with almost every single patient. Very rarely is it somebody you know by name uh, or have a relationship with, and that's one of the side of one of the things that increases our risk is the fact that we do not have a long-term uh, relationship. It's just a simple fact that people don't sue friends um, often. I mean, it depends on what how you, what you think of your friends, but um, you know, most people don't. They don't. So you don't sue people you like uh, in most cases, and. So that's one of the challenges of emergency med in medicine is establishing a relationship in a very limited amount of time. And so that's an obvious one that we have is that trying to build rapport, about trying to, you know, sitting down, you know, trying to actually make a personal contact with that person um, and show them that you care. But um, other, other than those obvious, and you can even expand on that if you wish, what are some of the tips that you have to help um, avoid a lawsuit? I mean, the caveat here, uh, that I want to make before we get into these tips is there's no 100 percent there's even even the best doctors making all the um, uh, you're, there's a potential of missing something where none of us are going to be 100 percent every single one of us is human um, but these are just things that we're going to talk about to decrease that risk and not open up a door that would uh, that doesn't necessarily have to be open okay let's first start off with the fact that bad outcomes on a, from a, for a patient does not indicate that there was a substandard standard of care given. People have bad outcomes and people try to blame from either out of anger, frustration, or lack of transparency or knowledge. How do you mitigate these things in advance? Well, documentation is very important. Your thought processes are good to put on a chart. Why are, uh, a diagnosis exists or does not exist? Because your thoughtful process about that indicates to the jury or to the plaintiff or whoever's reviewing the chart that you actually were thinking about this. So a child with meningitis to say does not have meningitis because he's playing with his iPad and uh, running around the room is your perfect defense. And abdominal pains, documenting no right lower quadrant tenderness twice during the ED stay, going back and doing a re-examination and documenting no right lower quadrant tenderness at this time certain will protect you, those type of things. Now you mentioned the fact that we have a very limited relationship with our patients, but we have a distinct advantage over any other specialties. People really hold emergency medicine in high regard. We did, um, focus groups in the college as we do public relations messages, we've actually brought people in. What do you think about emergency physicians? And they think we're young, we're energetic, and we're smart, and we have their best interests at heart. And that helps us. So when I go in, I, and you go in, Ryan, I'm, I'm sure that people are really glad to see you. They come into that ED, they're frightened, and a, a guy like you who's reassuring and calm, and say, we're gonna get to the bottom of this, and we're gonna at least get on a path to a right answer, reassures them, and they know that they have a colleague, I mean, they have a, a, a person who's really looking after them. And if they sense that you care, that goes so far in preventing any adverse uh, action against you in the future. The fact that you sat down or talked to them or explained to the family that we're gonna to try to get to the bottom of this or there's no more for us to do today because everything seems to be stable. And answering their questions will really go a long way to preventing um, a bad, like I said, an adverse action. Again, if they think you care, and if you were to give them your card and say, call me if anything changes, they almost never call. But the fact that you handed them a card and said, I'm here for you, it kind of leaves upon them a responsibility to say, look, I gave you the option to call me back if, I, if something developed or wasn't right when you walked out of that department. So the fact that we don't have a longstanding relationship can be beneficial in a way, because I think that they really do look upon the EDs as, as heroes for them in their acute moment of need. Most people do not go to the emergency department because they have nothing better to do. They are legitimately concerned or frightened, and that reassurance and Relieving that fear it goes a long way. You mentioned documentation is huge. One of the uh, shortcomings that we had for many years in emergency medicine was the paper, the paper chart. You know, the t the those little checkbox sheets and and things like that that don't give that narrative, don't allow you to tell that story. Um, EMRs, in many ways, are a little bit better, give you the opportunity to actually tell a narrative, especially if you can do some dictation, uh, pinning the dictation as accurate and don't change out to ridiculous words. Um, talk about how, uh, expand a little bit more on, on the charting aspects of things and how that will benefit us. Yes, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to talk about that. It's the EMR, electronic medical record, could be, help us and hurt us. Let me tell you how it can 
hurt us and then, oh, help us, I'll, I'll do that. Like you said, it shows your thought processes. If you could put a lot more in the record. It, you don't like you're a chicken scratch type doctor who hurriedly running through the exam. It shows some thoughtfulness and organization. And you can actually lay out your case of what your, your workup was. Um, the narrative is very important in medical decision making. Uh, MDM, that part of the chart is really what's gonna really just um, let people know how that encounter went and what was going on. So I would, if you focus on any part of the chart, MDM is the most important. Second is the history and looking for discrepancies. Now this is where we get into trouble because the, there's nurse triage notes that are buried on other screens or in other parts of the electronic program that we don't know about. So you really have to check the nurse triage notes. There's usually two sets, the triage nurse and then maybe if they're, and then there's the treating nurse. And those notes can really be conflict with what's in your note and that does not look good when blown up on placards in, in, a, in a court case. So really focus on those two parts of the record. Now here's the negative for the electronic medical record. We're gonna be held to a much higher standard for getting old records. Back in the day, we used to say, well, I couldn't get the records. They were locked away in the medical records department. There was no one there to help dig them out. Now, with uh, enterprise systems where you can not only get the hospital record, but even some outpatient clinic records with a few keystrokes, Mm, that's going to create a, a certain burden upon us to look back and see what has happened to that patient. I know a multi-million dollar lawsuit where uh, the records weren't checked from another hospital within the system, and it was a pattern of injuries that suggested abuse, and a child that ended up with a devastating neurologic injury settled for a very large amount of money against the state, the Division of Youth Family Services, and the physicians. So we've got to find ways to get help. When we're, in, when we're working in the ED, either scribes or other assistants to help pull up old records and look for what meaningful could have happened. So, and there's also another dangerous part of the EMR, and that's called time stamping. They could pull out the time stamps of every time that chart was accessed, which if you're not altering the record after the fact, it's not a big deal, but it does show what time things happen, and it's pretty accurate. So just be aware that those are things that are available that could be pulled out of the record that you don't normally uh, look at. And I want to refresh your memory about the Ebola case, the index case. The nurse had a travel history, so she said that it was in the notes. The doctor didn't see it because it was a new type of EMR and it was not aware and the patient that said they had not traveled internationally. People have different motivations to tell the truth about these type of things, especially with the stress on the um, immigration and all that's going on right now. So that's an example of where some give you positive in the, in the history somewhere else in the record and negative by the patient themselves and then there's a conflicting uh, record and then you could you're gonna be held accountable for knowing what's in that record even if you didn't write it one of the other things I've noticed as big and actually uh, Annalise Sorrentino mentioned in uh, her talk on pediatrics she gave in terms of uh, vitals are vital is that the information is only as good as the accuracy that's there and uh, a lot of times there's a lot of data, and I see this especially with blood pressures, oxygen saturations, uh, especially with these modern systems that they just do a click and it pulls the data from the monitor in the room into the EMR, and it's not cross-checked for accuracy. I see this all the time, somebody who's completely stable for something not related to um, infection or anything that would drop the blood pressure, and all of a sudden they've got this blood pressure that is significantly hypotensive and walk in there and the patient is on their side and and either the blood pressure cuffs are on the wrist or it's on the floor or something like that but the data is in the chart now it's it's official records what is the importance of looking at that chart you mentioned the triage aspects of things but looking through it to, to um, address uh, inaccuracies in the data that's actually in the chart well, a colleague of mine, Dan Sullivan, who's done a lot of risk management over the years, and I've done a lot of medical legal work, we agree, at running insurance companies, we agree that abnormal vital signs should be flagged so you see them, blinking red lights, you know? So at least you have a chance to address them and you're aware of it, because there's so much data overload in the emergency department. So the EMR systems, the software writers, we are really pleading with them, please flag them so they blink so we can address it. So let's talk about abnormal vital signs. Let's say pediatric population, like Dr. Sorrentino was talking about. If a kid's still febrile, but like I said, eating cheeses and drinking and happy, I document that. that. That supersedes vital signs. A child running around a room and happy supersedes any vital signs that may be in the record. However, if you have a blood pressure that's 90 on the discharge and they come back the next day with myocarditis, hypotensive, and shock, doesn't look good. So you have to use that clinical gestalt to say this patient walked out. By the way, that's a big one. I think a lot of these some of these bad back pain charts, epidural abscess cases, if we had only documented they walked out of the department comfortably, a lawsuit and action would not have happened. So 
if you got to you got to pay attention to the vital signs, but you also have to document the picture you're seeing. Well, perfused, pink, happy, uh, satisfied with care, has my number to call me back, um, et cetera. You mentioned, um, yeah, I definitely agree that we need to tell, the chart has to tell a story, and it needs to tell a story, the picture, and support the reason you made the decision that you made. Um, you mentioned the timestamps, and that uh, chart, uh, it's uh, one I reviewed that actually was an issue with timestamps and then having to, uh, you know, talk about why in critical care cases the timestamp of things mm -hmm. happening isn't actually necessarily when they happen. Um, but... You talk about, and actually, we did a talk at SEC ASAP a few years ago with a, a friend of mine who's a lawyer in uh, Memphis, and we talked about, you know, he says, if I get enough concern, I'll actually subpoena the keystrokes. So stuff that isn't doesn't even necessarily exist in the chart now, he can subpoena to see exactly what was there before, what it was changed to, and when it was changed. Talk about that after the fact um, importance of timely uh, completion of the records uh, before there's an issue and, and then avoiding things if there is an issue. All right, let me preface my remarks on this, the fact that we, we have the highest burnout of any specialty. And so after a brutal 12-hour shift, you do not want to stay three hours charting. But you do have to chart on certain patients, critically ill patients that you were, that were admitted. I try to chart on all, most admissions. And if I've had a difficult workup or encounter, I make sure that, that chart's signed, sealed, and delivered to the archive electronically before I leave the hospital. You and the rest of the charts you have a day or so, but you know, hopefully the ones that you don't predict or would never expect there to be an adverse outcome. So it's important because like you said, not could they subpoena and look at the timelines, they can subpoena phone calls. Like, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, I, I didn't get a call from Dr. Stanton. Well, yes, you did, we'll prove it. And so we actually, we've had to subpoena the phone records and it sometimes told the story that was favorable to us and otherwise not the, the other way. So they can subpoena phone records, they can also uh, subpoena office records or other conversations. That's why we say try to limit conversations on a, or documentation of any case to what's in the record, the facts. You don't want to be creating um, judgmental or subjective analysis of a, of, a bad out, of a case with a bad outcome. Yeah, one of the things he uh, actually mentioned was um, that idea of uh, one of the largest settlements he had, he had obtained was one that had an adverse outcome. Uh, the person, the provider, goes to their risk management, comes back, alters the chart, and he says one of the things that really tips them off is a chart that is too clean, that looks like it's, you know, it's been polished uh, after the fact. So let's, let's reference some of that, that of going in and after you learn of an adverse outcome of polishing a, a chart. Oh, yes. I mean... So this is one of the things we'll talk about in the lecture is that you don't go back and alter a chart after you've signed it and try to change the opinion, appearance of what happened. You can addendum a chart and say there was a bad, you know, the outcome was this and blah, 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 just the facts. But, uh, you know, they, back in the days of written charts, they would bring in forensic analysis who could tell you if it was a different pen, different ink, and almost uh, when it was not, not the exact time it was written, but it was written at a different time. But we could do that now electronically, like, like we, we just talked about. You don't want to do it. You don't want to alter a chart to cover up a bad outcome or make yourself, in a, paint yourself in a different light. Listen, we are, there, errors in judgment are not deviations in standard of care. I thought that Mr. Jones was able to walk and his back pain was musculoskeletal. I checked his pulses, everything was fine. But it, unknown to me, he had a aortic uh, dissection above his renal arteries that, um, and he was young, I had no, no um, and he was readmitted and operatively repaired, okay? So I may have missed the diagnosis, but the outcome was, was caught. I mean, the, the diagnosis was caught. So that kind of documentation um, is important. The other thing, be careful about radiology wet reads, wet reads, because sometimes the wet reads that are done are not tracked. In other words, some radiology systems that give you a wet read, once they do a final read, that wet read disappears, which I think is wrong. And we're, we had a meeting recently with time stamping with the Benchmarking Alliance, and we actually talked about radiology, and we, those wet reads should never be, should be archived. They should never be memorialized. Even though you change them, the fact that you did give me a wet read that said no subarachnoid, and then changed it, they should have that original read. Yeah, absolutely, and um, you know, I think some of the most important things here is, one is to be human, treat people with respect, document what happened, that your chart tells a story, um, don't go back and, and doctor things up, and. Now understand that for the majority of us, a lawsuit is going to happen at one time or the other, and don't let that 
destroy you and be able to, I mean, it's one epi- episode where I think you need to have support and you need to be able to uh, decompress on it, but it's almost something that has to be compartmentalized away from your family life and that sort of thing. I have two other caveats or, or pearls. Um, there's a thing called clinical imperatives, and you can come up with your own. Like one of mine is never discharge abdominal pain between 4 and 5.30 in the nadir of the night when you're really tired. If you're not sure about it, definitively sure about a diagnosis, wait till the light of day, and after the dust is settled and your relief has come, then you could discharge the person when you have time to think about it again. Number two, the use of uh, advanced practice providers is creating a different kind of risk. They're going to be either, you're going to be, could be named in an action for a bad outcome as a supervising physician, or they can be named as primarily as the um, the caretaker, and you could or could not be involved if whether or not you saw the patient. But you should have an idea of the patients you want them to see based upon their experience and training. You cannot transfer a lot of the responsibility to your APPs, especially within a few years of uh, training. And I think that you, it's incumbent upon you for certain diagnoses to uh, examine the patient and work on that, that differential and work up with them. All right, Dr. Michael Girardi, uh, fantastic. I think any talks that have to do with uh, decreasing uh, malpractice and uh, liability risk is huge. And uh, how can folks get in touch with you if they have any uh, questions, uh, comments, or uh, just want to come uh, visit New Jersey? <laughs> uh, M. Girardi at ASEP.org, M G E R A R D I at ASEP.org. And myself, 973 464 3351. 973 464 3351. To meet you again and talking again soon. Well, I'm just going to see you here in a, in a few weeks. I mean, it's, it's actually just a couple of months until we're back in at Destin once again. And uh, with that cell phone number, don't be blowing him up. I mean, respect him. I mean, he's he's got a few years under his belt. He probably doesn't do a lot of night shifts anymore. You need to not be calling him at four in the morning. He's trying to get some sleep here, folks. So uh, as for me, you can contact me, your everyday medicine at gmail.com, your everyday medicine at gmail.com, at everyday med on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. <laughs>